I'm going to use my grandfather square and you know I, I think just about everybody's grandfather has a square if not have a kid and have your dad buy one so therefore you can use your kid's grandfather square or you could play the long game and buy your own but you know your choice Welcome back. Today, we're gonna get our sides blocked together. Previously, we bent these. They're closely made. We've got our blocks here. This is the neck block. Make it however you want. I spared you the blah, blah, blah of me gluing this to this. Uh, I think you can figure that out. You choose the shape that works for you. I like this flata style. It works pretty well. I like the looks of it. It's fairly simple. And with my neck attachment method, this is really easy. So we're gonna shape this up, and then we're gonna get the sides mounted into the form. So it's a pretty easy process and let's go do it. All right, so I've got mahogany tail block here and I actually like the grain to go this way. I know a lot of makers like to do it this way, but this is way better. As somebody who does a lot of repairs and by a lot of repairs, I mean, I have, well, yeah, as you can see, it's stacked up. And one of the common places I see a repair coming from is the end block shrinkage. So if you put the end block in this way with the grain going vertically to the sides, it has a tendency to move in this direction a lot more with humidity causing cracks on the top and causing cracks on the back, commonly seen on Ramirez guitars. So to combat that, I just go this way. And then also I use mahogany or Spanish cedar just because they are dimensionally a lot more stable than spruce and you're not going to feel any of the extra weight. You know, use the material you like but this is what I like. So first off, because I'm gonna be making and essentially creating the lower portion of the guitar with this, I have a very carefully crafted vintage tail block form, and I'm gonna fit this piece to this, as well as shaping the corners. And then for the neck, because of the way that I attach it, I'm gonna be shaping this piece to fit as well, and this establishes my shoulder height as well. So I'm going to use my sander here. This is my belt sander, and then I'm also going to be using my disc sander just to kind of speed things up as well, and then to create this, and then I'll show you how I handle the shaping of this tongue portion. You know, I, I like to have this underneath the fingerboard. It, I find that it gives a little bit more structure and a little bit more of a solid feel, but again, you do you, this is not hypercritical. So without further ado, let's get the shaping. As always, I like to keep a set of headphones nearby. So let's do this and we'll get this sanded up. One thing I never point out, this is actually one of the most dangerous times to be using any machine. Because in your brain, after you hit that off switch, it's off. But in reality, this thing is still going. And I don't care if it's your table saw, your combination disc belt sander, or your band saw, or your radial arm saw, or anything. No tool is absolutely safe until it stops moving. And I'm even going to include your dust collector to that too. Because if you're cleaning up something and you've got a moving blade and it's still kind of rolling and collapsing down, you've got a very dangerous situation on your hands. So never ever switch off your brain the instant you switch off your tool. As soon as your tool's off, you gotta make sure it's stopped. And at that point, 
it's mostly safe. So now that we've got this shaped so that way the back end fits our call, I want to put a bevel onto this. So I'm gonna take the chisel that I just sharpened in the last video and just do some nice beveling on the edges. All right, so all I'm gonna do is take my chisel and make a chamfer from here to here, trying to be as even as possible. Now, as much as I like to preach, you know, keep your fingers out of the way and anything that you don't wanna jam this into out of the way, this is one of those ones where if you're not careful, you can either dent your chisel pretty badly or yourself. So this is one of the reasons why I like this flay to style shape is I can kind of hold it in place and I'm pushing forward and down with my thumb and down with my index finger. You can see how the tip is turning white here and then stabilize here and I'm gonna have to work pretty hard to get myself cut. So I'm just gonna go in and take a couple cuts. You know, try not to take out my bench dog, my chisel edge, or my fingers. And just make this look nice. Now I don't have to go all the way to the edge, and in fact for this guitar I'm not, because I know I'm gonna have to trim this back. So, because I'm right-handed, that's the easy part. The hard part is making it look the same on the other side. So for that, I like to turn it on its side. And work inward in this direction. So now that that's even, I'm going to trim the height of this because this is going to be going up against the top. Obviously this is where the sides are. If you remember from the back video, this has a dome. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a jig which will cut an angle on the table saw. So let's go do that. All right, so in order to get the sides to line up, what we have to do is take the sides that we bent earlier, which now fits up against here really well. But when you pull it in, you can see that the center line is over here. And so we've got all this extra waste on the other side. That's good because that meant that we had a really good bet and we use the appropriate amount of material. So I'm going to kind of work my way around here using these flip lever clamps. And these are far one of my favorite tools in the shop just because they're versatile, they're, they're easy, they can't, they don't put too much pressure on, but they grab very, very well. So I'm just kind of walking this around just to make sure I've got a good tight fit. And I'm going to do this for the other side as well, making sure it's down on the very bottom. So I'm going to take my knife because if I use a pencil, this has a diameter of 0.7 millimeters, meaning I've got 0.7 millimeters of insecurity and I'm not sure that's the right spot. If I use the edge of my knife, that is literally a knife's edge for making a mark. So I'm going to go right into the middle of this line here I'm just going to make a little bit of a mark uh, perpendicular to the grain of the wood so that way I can easily see it. So without undoing this one, I'm going to walk the rest of these clamps around to do the upper side. Alright, so now that I've got this all the way around and I made sure that this is down. Again, in order to do this, you kind of have to be ambidextrous. So I will admit I'm not as good with my left hand, but there, I made a mark. That's all I need. So I'm going to pop this out of the mold down. And now that it's out, I'm going to use my grandfather's square. And, you know, I, I think just about everybody's grandfather has a square. If not, have a kid and have your dad buy one so therefore, you can use your kid's grandfather's square. Or you could play the long game and buy your own, but, you know, your choice. So I'm going to go against that flat side that we've been referencing to, which was down. I'm going to make sure that's lined up to the line, and I'm going to give one, and only one pass across. So that way, I've got one concise line. I know that if I cut to the center of that line, I'm going to be precise. And since this is the tail, this was our flat side, I'm going to make an X on it right here. That's inside the line, which is right here. So this way, being inside the line, I know that if I see X and an X there, that means that these two are proper. If I see an X up here, 
I'm, I'm going to know that this other side is flipped around. So I'm looking for this X right here after I cut that off and trim it down. This side I'm not too worried about. If only I can find that mark I made. It's right there. Very faint. Actually, this is much easier to do on the edge of a bench just because you can work both sides of the square. So, right up to that line again. And one quick pass. And because I like to build this from the tail block up, I don't have to worry about putting a mark there. So let's cut this off at the bandsaw and then we'll sand this off at the belt sander. Okay, so this is what I'm looking for. I'm gonna use this to take away everything this way. And while typically you use the bandsaw in this configuration, I'm actually gonna go at it this way and take this as one giant cut. Obviously, I'm gonna be leaving a little bit of a line. This for me is just getting rid of the excess. So I'm gonna do this on all four sides. All right, so now that that's all cut down, I've got a very light amount to go to the line. And so I could either come in with a hand plane, but then I worry about chipping out here. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get up against here, and this is kind of terrifying now that I actually think about it, but I'm gonna rest my hand here, and then here on this moving belt sander, and then bring it down until I reach the center of the line. And I'm gonna do this on all four corners again, so. Here we go, it's pretty quick. All right, so now we've established how high is this neck block going to be. And so I'm reading 94 millimeters. So now that I know that this is going to be 94 millimeters, I can cut the neck block height down to 94 millimeters which actually is not going to be all that much. I've got my table saw set up here with this box. The box of terror, I suppose. You only want to use this with your hands on the outside. You, you don't even want to do like this because that can cut off your hand. All this can cut off your hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by figuring out how far it is from this block here on its edge to the inside edge of the blade. And so I'm seeing 96. So through my very carefully calibrated shim pack, you know, like this one, is, I know right off the bat, that's gonna be too thick because that's four. So if I put that in there, that's at like 92. So I need something like half that thick. So again, going back to my very carefully calibrated shim pack, I can pretty quickly get it to 94. Uh, there's my 94. So I'm going to take this, put it in here. I'm going to clamp it down with a clamp because I'm not using my hands for this. And then I'm going to cut this off at the angle because there's a very slight angle. But this is clamped on. I'm going to turn on the saw. I'm going to turn on my dust collector first because, again, this is a dustier operation. I want to collect as much dust as possible. And I'm going to push it through, and then I'm going to turn off the saw. I'm not going to go forward and backwards because I don't want an hourglass-shaped cut. I want to do all the shaping. So, dust collector, and then this. It's a simple process, but this really takes care of a lot of things. It makes fitting the neck to the body a lot easier. It makes fitting the back to those sides a lot easier. It makes installing the linings a lot easier. So uh, now that that's done, let's go install it onto the guitar. Gotta deburr. All right, so now I'm gonna put these together. They fit really, really well, as you can see. And I've got my X next to my X which is what I want. So to hold them together, you're gonna wanna use blue tape. The reason being, the blue tape will come undone. If you use something like the Stumac binding tape, that's got a PSA backing, otherwise known as a pressure sensitive adhesive. So as much pressure as you put onto it, it's going to require that much 
coming off. So if you're going to be clamping this, you don't want to use a PSA adhesive. So the way I'm going to do this, I make it look like an eye. So I'll put one piece across the top, make sure I'm snugging them in really tight. Then I'm going to do one piece across the bottom. Again, making sure, oops, get it on there really tight. Making sure it's snugged all the way across the bottom. Okay, so that way it's tight. And then I'm going to actually surprisingly carefully measure from top to the bottom. So that way you get just a little bit extra clamping force at these two points. Now this side is ready to go. It's going to be the same on the top side. But uh, I actually like to get this one glued up first um, just because it's facing this way. A section of the Wall Street Journal is just large enough to keep your bench from getting completely glued up with this operation. We need to find the center of this. And now I'm going to use a pencil because it doesn't matter too much. So we're going to find the center of this. This is really easy. 59. So half of 60 is 30, so 29 and a half. So I know that if I line this up here, it's going to line up with my center line. Likewise, I got to find the center of this. That's 44. So that's going to go up there. All we're going to do is we're going to use this, our call, our tail block, this clamp with a flat edge. And all we need is one clamp. So real quickly. I like to pull my glue up from the bottom so that way anything that's dripping drips right back into the glue pot and it's always kind of baiting itself. So very carefully that goes on, tail block is outside, make sure everything is pushed down, your coal, clamp. And together and that is how you install the glue box I'm just gonna do it for the top side so if you like content like this please like subscribe buy some merch uh, I've got coffee mugs and various other things it really really helps out the channel and Please use the promo code YouTube if you want to see more content like this. It'll take $500 off of commission of a new guitar, uh, which also will be reflected in the final price. Uh, we'll see you next time.